Good morning. morning. Tomorrow marks the birthday of Queen Victoria, who was the ruling monarch at the time of Canada's birth as a country in 1867. It's a day to celebrate all the wonderful things that make Canada, Canada. But long before that, we had the indigenous folks who were looking after the land. And it is in this light that we acknowledge the land at this time. For thousands of years, First Nations people have walked on this land and their relationship with the land has been at the center of their lives and spirituality. The land that we are standing on today is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Ashnagbeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, is now home to many diverse nations, Inuit and Métis people as well. We acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13, signed with the Mississaugas of the Credit, and the Williams Treaty signed with multiple Mississaugas and Chippewa bands. It is important that we continue to acknowledge their stewardship of this land throughout the ages. A warm welcome to all who are joining our service on this Victoria Day long weekend. The unofficial start to summer, complete with opening cottages, planting your gardens, and enduring a thunderstorm or two. (laughs) I would like to take this opportunity to introduce two guests who will be looking after our service this morning. Our guest minister is Reverend Linda Petrides, and our guest music coordinator, director, whatever terminology you would like to be called by, is Mr. Matthew Krasinowski. We look forward to listening to your messages and enjoying your musical talents during our service today. Ladies and gentlemen, As you know, Ross and his wife have been in Calgary this last week cheering on their daughter, Ella, who is competing in the ESSO Cup, Canada's National Under-18 Women's Club Hockey Championship. The team has earned a berth in the championship game, which takes place this afternoon. And it is on TSN3 at 5.30, if you'd like to tune in. Oh, Ella's number is 72. Next weekend is a big weekend in a number of different ways. The opportunity for us to open our doors, to invite people in, to share our heritage, is all a part of Doors Open Toronto. And so, please, if you are here, enjoy. If you are going to enjoy, invite those folks who are joining us next week to come back in future weeks as well. Next Sunday, we are also going to have the opportunity, and we hope that you will join us, Reverend Linda will be here. No, you're not the minister next week. No, Bright is back. (laughs) Along with Trish Cook, Tricia Cook, our church administrator, as we take the opportunity to celebrate and thank them for their outstanding contributions to Knox. During the week leading up to Doors Open, I should also make note of something that is in your bulletin this morning. It happens to be, well, I can't get any brighter than that, can it? Please take note that there is an all candidates meeting which has been planned. It is in our CE building and it is on May the 25th at 7 p.m. So please take note of that 
Don't throw that one out because on the back is even more information that you will need. For those who are viewing our services online this week, just to let you know that we will be making some format changes beginning in June. We would appreciate hearing from you and getting your thoughts on these changes as we enter a different phase of our online services. And finally, a very quick reminder that at our time of offering, plates will not be passed along in the pews, but ushers are available at the front and rear of the sanctuary to receive your offering as you leave the sanctuary. Enjoy the long weekend. We light the Christ candle this morning to remind us that God is with us, we are not alone. Last week um, during the council meeting, it reminded me of people in this church who work tirelessly behind the scenes to ensure that we have a place to gather together to worship, a place where we can come and experience God's presence with us a place where we can think about life, how we can love and care for other people, and a place where we can be inspired. So this morning we are going to light the memorial candles to remember all the people who have dedicated their lives to creating places that are sacred and special and loving and kind. I invite you to please join with me in the call to worship, which is found printed in your bulletins. God, you have brought us into this sacred place. We lay our worries down. We come as brothers and sisters in Christ. Shine your spirit of truth on us. We come to worship you with open hearts and minds. Teach us to be your church and your people as we worship together. Our Opening hymn is Spirit, Spirit of Gentleness in Voices United 375.
The opening prayer is found in your bulletins. Let us pray. Holy God, we reflect on the mystery of your presence with us. Forgive us when we hold back from living in your love and in your commandments. Anchor us in your love and ground us in your peace. Open us to the truth and the comfort of your Holy Spirit, today and always. Amen. We continue now with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We are God's children. God's steadfast love surrounds us. God has given us the spirit of truth, transformed our fears into love, and our lives into an offering to God and to the world. Thanks be to God. Amen. You're invited to stand and sing our response of praise. Our children's hymn is that all-time favorite, Jesus Loves Me, and in Voices United, it's 365.
Michelle and Sarah and Angela. Come on down, friends. Awesome. Good morning, good morning. Oh, you brought something to share today. Awesome. Hi, Gwendolyn. Oh, you too. <laughs> All righty, Liam. Good stuff. Okay, well, as Mr. Lundy said, right, this weekend is kind of the official kickoff almost to summer, right? It's not quite summer yet, but boy, we sure did feel like it, right? We had a heat wave, we had a thunderstorm, and of course, and today many of our church family are off doing some family things this weekend too, because this is the first weekend in a couple of years where things have reopened, right? That we can open again safely for some things. So today, and I really like that Reverend Petrides is speaking to, to us today about love, right? We can never talk too much about what love really means because as easy as it is to say sometimes, it's not really easy to really feel, to really show, to really follow through with if you really think about it. Sometimes we put our conditions on love. So I wanted to show that with playing a little game. Last week we used the balloons and Sean was such a good helper um, by carrying in a bunch of balloons and we learned something about that. Today we're gonna do something a little different. I have my two volunteers, Sarah and Angela, who are gonna help me. Come on up over here. We're gonna play a little game called Minute to Win It. So color, color, does it matter? No, nope, you're good? Okay, so turn over here, face this way. Face this way, let's move away from the fire. Come on over here. <laughs> Okay, and give yourself some space. So what they're going to do here, I'm going to give them a minute on my timer clock, and only using one hand, they've got to keep it up in the air. Now, your feet are now glued to the floor, okay? So not only your feet are glued to the floor, you can only use one hand to try and keep that balloon up and going in the air. So let's think about a strategy. If you've got one, I'm going to give you a... Ah, I was going to go 30 seconds, but let's do a minute. Let's do the minute. I, these girls can handle the minute. Let's go. Minute. Ooh, about to do 50, 50 minutes. We don't want to do that. <laughs> we'll be here. We'll be here all morning. There it is. Four, oh, one. And where am I? Zero. There we go. One minute. Here we go. Okay, friends. Liam and Ewan and Gwendolyn. Do we think who's going to win? Who, who's going to take this out of the sisters? Gwendolyn, what do you think? She feels like Sarah's got this. Okay, okay. Liam, Ewan, do we agree? What do you think? Oh, you think Angela may? Okay, so we've got one for Angela. You're the tiebreaker, Liam. What do you think? Is it going to be the little sister or the big sister? Oh, big brother's trying to tell little brother. It's the big brother, the big sister. <laughs> okay, well, let's find out, shall we? Here's a minute. Here's a minute to win it, and you're on. Go. Let's see. Oh, oh, I see some strategy. They're very controlled here. They're very controlled at the moment. Oh, 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 Angela brought it back. That's great. We're only 10 seconds in. That's great. Very controlled here. Oh, 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 that was a close one for Sarah. Oh, it went over. Ah! Okay, try again, try again. Keep going. Keep going. Let's see if Angela can hold this to the end. Let's see. Can she? Oh, there we go. Good job. You're halfway there. 30 seconds to go. 30 seconds to go. Feeling it? Good, good. Oh, oh. Remember those feet are glued, glued, keep glued. There we go. 20 seconds to go. Here we go. 19, 18. Oh, that was a close one. 17. Gee, the control on the face. Oh, Sarah, I love it. 10 seconds, Angela. Bring it home. Bring it home, Angela. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. <laughs> Come on back and join us. So the older sister did take it. <laughs> now, how does that, oh, there it goes. It's kind of doing my little alarm for us. How did that feel? How did that feel when you guys were about to have that challenge? How did that feel? A little bit nervous, right? One, you're in front of kind of our church family, too. You're on the, <laughs> you're on the stage kind of thing. But were you trying to think through the conditions I put on, right? Your feet were glued. You could only use one hand. So it restricted a little bit more of what you could try and do to win, right? Sarah, where did it go off course for you? You know, <laughs> the balloon kind of has a mind of its own, right? It just kind of goes where it wants to go. Didn't want to cooperate. And so how did you feel that your sister won and you lost? Okay, I feel happy for her, but I'm going to beat her next time. <laughs> I love it, I love it. Now, why we did that this morning is to kind of show, you know, it feels good when we win, right? It feels good when we've got, we're in control, we got this. 
Um, you know, we were cheering both of you on, and then at the end we were really cheering Angela to make it through. But then it also feels kind of frustrating, and it kind of builds up the, oh, I want to do better next time. And sometimes, now these two I knew would be gracious with each other, but sometimes when we lose, is it easy to lose? No. And is it always, do we always sometimes say or do the right things when we lose? Can we sometimes get angry? Absolutely, right? It hurts sometimes to lose. But what's really awesome is that God loves us no matter what. And he loves us when we win. He loves us when we lose. And if you can even imagine how much God loves us, he loves us so much that he gave us the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is something really amazing that helps us. And I know the Holy Spirit is with Sarah and Angela, just their relationship and how they are together and how they lift each other up. Whether they win or lose, they're there for each other. And that's something that I want us to remember because God really needs us to love each other, right? And it's hard sometimes. You're like, I win, I win, I win. Oh, wait, I need to remember you lost. It's okay. You'll win next time. You've got to show that love and that care for everybody, right? And when somebody doesn't win and when you've won, we've got to remember that frustration and that hurt. But it's not easy, is it? It's hard. And especially when we think of big world things going on, it's hard to love what's going on in the world today, isn't it? And how to figure out how to show love. But that's where the Holy Spirit is really working extra hard. And if we look at some of the stories that are going on in the world today, God is doing amazing things through people who are offering hope and comfort and strength and peace and love. And that's something that I hope we can take with us today. So we're going to go down, we're going to play a bit more downstairs, we're going to play some games together. Some of us are going to win, some of us are going to lose, but we're going to figure out how to play together. Let's pray first, let's just say a thanks to God first, then we'll head down together. All right. <laughs> okay, can you pray with me? Pray with me? Okay. Dear God, thank you for today. Thank you for your power and your strength. Thank you for your love and your compassion. Help us. To love, others to love others with how you love us. Thank you for the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's go, friends. Good morning. Good morning. This morning's scripture is taken from John chapter 14, reading verses 15 to 21, found on page 109 of the New Testament. If you love me, you will keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to be with you forever. This is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him because he abides with you, and he will be in you. I will not leave you orphaned. I am coming to you. In a little while, the world will no longer see me, but, I, but you will see me. Because I live, you will also live. On that day, you will know that I am in the Father, and you in me, and I in you. They who have my commandments and keep them are those who love me, and those who love me will be loved by my Father, and I will love them and reveal myself to them. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks be to God. Amen.
Let us pray. Loving God, speak to us all so that we can carry your message from this place into our lives and into the world during the coming days and weeks. Amen. In the Gospel passage this morning, Jesus is sitting with his disciples at what we usually refer to as the Last Supper. They've finished eating, and Jesus has already washed all their hands and feet. Judas, the disciple who has betrayed Jesus, has already left the room, and events have been set in motion that will eventually lead to the death of Jesus on the cross. So that's the setting. Supper is finished, and we all know what's coming next. So it's here, in this setting, at this table, that Jesus begins to recite his most extensive list of instructions to his disciples. It's here, in this 14th chapter of the Gospel of John, that D Jesus does some of his most significant teaching. If you love me, he says, you will keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to be with you forever. This is the Spirit of Truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him or knows him. You know him because he abides with you and will be in you. I will not leave you orphaned. I am coming to you. Now Jesus goes on like this for another four chapters, telling his disciples everything they need to know before he leaves them. But where is he going? I'm sure they all wonder, where is he going? Well, we know he's going to die as a matter of fact. Only that's not the way that Jesus tells it. Barbara Brown Taylor, one of my favorite authors, says that Jesus tells it as if he's going off to a family reunion with his father that no one else is invited to. And he is leaving them, the disciples, in charge while he's gone. He will be back. But in the meantime, his list of instructions is so long that I'm sure it raises some anxiety in those disciples about how long he will be away. A little while, Jesus reassures them, and you will see me. Well, a few of them did later on, but then he was gone again, and a little while became a long while, and a long while became a lifetime. And 10 years turned into 100 years, and then 500 years, and then 1,000. And now, from where we sit, it has been so long that some of us wonder if we have not been left orphaned after all. Is he gone, or isn't he? And if he's gone, where is he gone? And what in the world will we do without him? And if he's not gone, where is he exactly? And why doesn't Jesus show himself? Like questions, lots of questions. In my family growing up, I was the oldest of three daughters. And so I was the designated babysitter in my family. From time to time, I was the one that my parents left in charge when they went out at night. First, my parents would remind me that I was the oldest, the responsible one. I would not let the house burn down. I would make sure that my sister stayed inside, and I would know to, where to phone if we needed help. And after everyone kissed everyone goodbye, I was in charge. My sisters would look at me with some hope. I mean, it might be fun. But they were also concerned. I wasn't mom after all. But anyway, we played games and we read stories and we made sandwiches. But as the night wore on, they got crankier and crankier. And then came the questions. Where are mommy and daddy? Where did they go? When will they be back? I reassured them the best I could. I made up elaborate stories about what we would all do together in the morning. I promised them if they would just go to sleep, I would make sure 
that mommy and daddy kissed them goodnight when they got home. I tried to make everything sound normal. But how did I know? How did, how did I know that our parents would come home for certain safe and sound? I mean, it was hard being the babysitter because I was a potential orphan too. I had as much to lose as my sisters and as much to fear. But I could not give in to it because I was the one in charge. I was supposed to know better. I was supposed to exude confidence and create the same thing in them. I was supposed to know all the answers. Most of you know what I mean, not only because you were babysitters too, but because you are followers of Jesus and expected to know what that means. We are, all of us, Christ's elder children in the world, the ones he has left in charge. We're the responsible ones, the ones he has trusted to carry on his name. And everywhere we go, we see the faces of the people he has left in our care. And that's what we are instructed to do, to love and to care for others. In fact, we are commanded to love one another. In this day and age, it sounds rather peculiar to be commanded to love. Our notion of love is that love is a feeling, something we fall in and out of, um, as if it's something we stumble upon. You, you can't command a feeling, you can't say, be happy. But in the strange logic of the gospel, you can say, love one another. One of the dearest passages in this gospel is John 3:16, and you all know it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. And Jesus is about to demonstrate the depth of that love by obediently moving towards the cross and loving us even unto death. And on the way there, he commands us to love. If you love me, he says, you will keep my commandments. Some scholars say that it's quite likely that Jesus means, because you love me, you will keep my commandments. It's not so much a matter of proving our love for him by keeping his commandments, but rather our keeping of his commandments is the fruit of our love for Jesus. I mean, sometimes this, those scholars sound kind of complicated, but it's really simple because either way, Jesus' linking of command and love puts some shape and substance into how we think about love. Here at the church, we talk a lot about love. We talk about covenant love and the promises that God's love for us is steadfast and forgiving. We talk about how to extend that covenant love to one another, and we make promises to love each other. One of the things that most of us learn in long-term relationships is that love, real, deep, abiding love, is more the result of those relationships than its cause. Strange but true, especially when we think about marriage, for example. A couple standing before God and the church at the time of their wedding may think that love is the reason for their wedding, the cause of their marriage. They are here in the church having a wedding because they are in love. That's what they feel. And of course, to some degree, it's true. But over the years, they learn that in the struggle to be faithful and in the determination to keep their promises, that love is not just a feeling, but love is an act of will. Making and keeping their promises for better or for worse taught them to love deeply and with intention. In all our relationships, when we work at keeping our promises, 
when we faithfully hold to what we promise to do, it becomes easier and easier to keep those promises. And that's how Jesus speaks of love. Love is a commitment to a way of life, God's way. Love will grow and deepen as it is tested and proven in life's challenges. If you love me, Jesus says, you will keep my commandments. But Jesus knew that his commandments would not be enough and that over time we would all get cranky waiting. And so Jesus promises that we would be given another advocate, the spirit of truth. We would not have to be in charge all by ourselves. This advocate would help us with the answers and lead us to a deeper knowledge of God's way and give us strength for the journey. And Jesus promises that this other advocate will be with us forever. Over and over, Jesus tells his disciples and us that God will not leave us as orphans, ever. You see, God loves us so much that God just can't stay away from us. God wants to be in constant contact with us. Like the best of parents, God wants to nurture us and to lift us up to live happy and productive lives. God wants to protect us and guide us, instruct us to heal us, to forgive us, to love us, and to wipe away our tears. How in the world could anyone refuse such an utterly amazing love like that. No wonder it took four more chapters of instruction for Jesus to teach the disciples how to be in charge. It all boils down to love. The kind of love that Jesus showed to us right up until the end. The kind of love that calls us to be not only obedient, but also faithful, to have faith that the Holy Spirit moves among us, empowering each one of us to reach out in love to the world around us so that we can continue to spread the love of Jesus by doing good works and by keeping his commandments. This week, Let us keep our hearts open and ask ourselves, how can we do a better job of loving? There are many hurting people out there and in here that need to be loved. People who need to know that God loves each and every one of them and us, and that God will not leave us orphaned. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let's join our voices together in singing Love Divine, All Loves Excelling from Voices United, number 333.
Our offering allows us to give generously so we may spread the love of God in our community and around the world. Let us stand and sing our offertory response. May our gifts be used with wisdom and with justice in the church and throughout the world. Amen. Please be seated. The prayers of the people are in a little different format this morning. There will be lots of silent opportunities for you to consider the people in your lives for whom you wish to pray. There are no communal responses, only the prayers spoken in the silence of your own hearts. You can follow along in the bulletins if you like, or you can simply listen and focus your, on your own thoughts and prayers. Let us pray. Oh God, as we go to our homes and our work this coming week, we ask you to send the Holy Spirit into our lives. Open our ears that we may hear what you are trying to say to us in the things that happen to us and in the people we meet. Where does God speak to you in your daily life? Open our eyes that we may see the needs of people around us. We continue to pray, especially for the Ukrainian people and so many other people around the world who are in need of help. Where do you see suffering? Open our hands that we may do our work well and help when help is needed. Although you can't help everyone, who can you help? Open our lips that we may tell the good news of Jesus and bring comfort, happiness, and laughter to others. Who can you talk to this week? Open our minds that we may discover new truth about you in the world. What are you especially mindful of this week? And open our hearts that we, we may love you and others as you have loved us. How will the gentleness of your hearts be made known? Amen. Our closing hymn is number 371, Open My Eyes That I May See.
Let us go from here, uplifted by the words we have heard, warmed by the presence we have felt, strengthened by the community around us, and certain that we are never alone. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the community of the Holy Spirit be with you always. Amen. Thank you.